Jack, one, two. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we're going to call on uh, one of our former chiefs of Alexis Nakoda Sioux Nation and also ceremonialist and elder Howard Musters to come and say invocation. I want to uh, take this opportunity in thanking you all. Uh, I want to thank my, my brother, the MC, my brother, the head drummer here, and, and all of my adopted boys that are here helping out in the uh, coordination and uh, in, uh, making sure that uh, the conference is, is a success. But before I get into the uh, invocation, I want to uh, uh, take this opportunity in uh, having to uh, thank you all and, and encourage you all to uh, not to quit what you're doing. You know, we uh, a big uh, portion uh, of the people that are homeless, that are in destitute situations, are our relatives, our, our uncles, our aunts, our in some instances, even our grandparents are are uh, in that situation, and I think uh, you know uh, by choice maybe some of them uh, uh, want to remain in that uh, where they don't want they don't want to come out and and uh, and feel and challenge some of the realities in life. I think uh, over the years because of the abuse. Uh, deriving from the residential school and policies and uh, racism in uh, here in, in Canada, in Alberta, has driven some of our people to become uh, hopeless and live in that environment. And so we try to do, uh, some of us uh, volunteer our, our services, I'm retired, but I, I do a lot of volunteer cultural, spiritual work trying to encourage our people to uh, reconnect themselves with uh, with their original spiritual origin, and as for those of you that are working with them, please respect that. You know, please respect where, who they are, and where their their spiritual origin lies, and try and encourage them. You know, to reclaim that. And so, on that note, I will lead us in prayer. Pray with me the best way you know how. There's one elder told me once. He said that we are humans. He said, the only one that, that prays and does things in perfection is the Creator. Okay, in memory of the young men, young women, 
in the First World War, Second World War, various other campaigns that gave their lives for the, our way of life and the freedom and culture that we enjoy. Flag song, Eagle River. You flag, flag song. Now the retreat victory song.
River. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, bearing the Eagle Staff, Mayor of Edmonton, Don Iverson. Also flanking Grand Chief of Treaty 6, also former Member of Parliament and lawyer, Wilton Lilchow. <laughs> former Chief and Elder, Howard Mussos. Canadian flag, Jerry Puligandi, Homeward Trust. Alberta flag, Beverly Allard. Edmonton flag, Robert Poole, City of Edmonton. And Homeward Trust. I think that's it, right, Jerry? Susan, okay, Susan. Yeah, and Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, J Tim Richer, Home Homeward Trust, Susan McGee, Elders, Clayton Shirt, Millie Omsby, Laureen Blue Waters, Elsie Paul, Howard Musters, Philip Musters, Will Campbell, Joyce Pambram, <laughs> Alexander Senior Princess, Kayleen Susan Eggbell, Alexis Nakoda Sioux Nation, Lil Warrior, Jadis Alexis, and we have uh, some of our local dancers and just come, everybody come. I don't have everybody's name, so thank you for bearing with me. We want to give recognition to Minister Sani. Min Minister Sani from Community. Okay, also a special acknowledgement to Minister Sani from Community Alliance to End nope. Homelessness. Nope. That she is the Minister of Community Services. Oh, the Minister of Community Services. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My job is finished. You may sit down, and I'm going to turn the mic over to somebody here. <laughs> somebody will be speaking. You have guest speakers and VIPs and all kinds of guests. Okay, I think Tim Richard is going to be the master of ceremonies, right? That's it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, for the welcome. Uh, thank you for the ceremony. Uh, good morning, uh, friends. My name is Tim Richter. I'm president and CEO of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Welcome to the 2019 National Conference on Ending Homelessness. I got to say that I'm, I'm really uh, uh, happy that the light here is really bright because I can't see you all, otherwise I'd be scared to death uh, of this room. Look around, 1,500 people. How, how awesome is it to be in a room of 1,500 people from all over the country, gathered and united with one focus, one mission, and that's to end homelessness in Canada. If there, if there was ever a doubt that we could end homelessness in Canada, those doubts vanish with one look uh, at this room. We've got an incredible program for the next two and a half days with 300 speakers, 86 sessions, and some really world-class keynote speakers, and you're going to hear from some of them uh, now. I'm pleased to begin our program this morning by welcoming Minister Rajan Sani, Alberta's Minister of Community and Social Services, to make some welcoming remarks. Minister.
Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start off by reading the vision statement of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. And that is, all Canadians have a safe, decent, and affordable home with the necessary support to sustain it. All Canadians. And the reason that I'm reading this vision statement is not as a reminder, but as an affirmation as to why we are all here today. I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of our Premier, the Honourable Jason Kenney, and my colleagues in government. It brings me great satisfaction and hope to see all of you here today. This room is filled with people who are committed to making a difference, to exploring new and innovative ways to help Canadians experiencing homelessness. This is going to take tremendous determination, perseverance, and ingenuity to find the best solutions. As leaders, policymakers, academics, advocates, and frontline workers, you have the experience and the expertise to help our most vulnerable citizens. And I strongly believe that the intellectual prowess that we have in this room is what will ultimately drive innovative solutions necessary to make a difference in these individuals' lives. I recognize that the collective wisdom in this room is going to be what will make the difference. And I'm very proud that our capital city was chosen to host this year's conference. So I welcome all of you who have traveled from across the country to be here today. Thank you. Every year, thousands of people in this capital city find themselves without a home. Out of these thousands, over 1,700 people are experiencing chronic homelessness. That number is far too high. And I know that there are several agencies and groups in the city and in this province who have taken on this issue and have cared deeply about these individuals. Our government has said, and I have personally said it many times, that we believe in partnering with these individuals and organizations who are best positioned to help people in their communities. And we are committed to working with them and with all levels of government to address homelessness. It will take a holistic and collective effort from all of us. Since becoming Alberta's Minister of Community and Social Services this spring, I've met with many people who work hard every single day to end homelessness, some of whom are in the audience today who I've already spoken to this morning, and there are many here that I'm really looking forward to meeting. I've learned a lot. I have so much to learn. I continue to learn every day about this complex issue. Indeed, this is a challenging field to work in, and I'm working in this field now as well, and I just want to take a moment to commend each and every one of you for your passion and your commitment. Conferences like today's are a necessity. It's how we bring the best and the brightest minds together. This is indeed a dedicated space and time to share ideas and to learn from one another. And over the next few days, I know that there are going to be many opportunities to engage, to connect, to learn, to inspire one another, and in turn, to be inspired. And I really do look forward to working with all of you and with individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness. I don't think it's aspirational to say this, and I know that this is one of the values that is listed on the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness's website, and that is that I know that we all believe that ending homelessness is possible. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Minister Sani. So much of any homelessness comes down to leadership, and there's not many mayors in Canada that have been more passionate, more vocal, or more effective than Mayor Don Iveson of Edmonton. Mayor Iveson is a champion of affordable housing and ending homelessness, not only here in Edmonton, but among his peers 
uh, as chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. It's now my pleasure to welcome Mayor Don Iveson to make welcoming remarks on behalf of the City of Edmonton. Well, thank you, Tim, uh, for those kind words. Thank you, Elder Mustas, uh, for starting us off in a good way. Grand Chief Littlechild, it's always a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Minister Sani, thank you for joining us this morning and for your continued commitment to this work. Uh, I want to recognize Member of Parliament Adam Vaughan, who's here as well, uh, from Toronto, and a great champion on this file and for housing. And a former city councillor who gets that uh, City Hall in partnership with all of you in community, and I think the Minister would acknowledge too, uh, that that's uh, on the ground is where we make change in these uh, shared national goals, provincial goals, and civic goals. And so uh, I'm very privileged to be here. Obviously, I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for the opportunity to carry in the Eagle Staff this morning. I'm, I'm quite moved by this morning's uh, opening, in fact, and grateful to uh, all of you who have made the long journey here to Edmonton and also to those of you from here who do this work in our community every day. It's extraordinary. Yes, absolutely give yourselves a round of applause. So uh, take it from Tim, not from me, but Tim has said that Edmonton might be the best big Canadian city uh, at implementing housing first. And we are uncharacteristically shy here in Edmonton uh, about our accomplishments. We're not given to bragging, but it is a point of pride that we have made significant progress on cutting homelessness in half over the last decade. As a matter of fact, I had a chance to sit and have lunch with uh, former Premier Ed Stelmack, who was leading our province at the time when Alberta stepped out first among provinces, adopted Housing First, and said, we will rise to the challenge of ending homelessness in Alberta. And I sat with him, and he asked how it was going. And I said, well, here's the good news. We've housed, at that time, 9,310 people using Housing First. And we have taken homelessness from 10 years ago, being around 3,200 individuals experiencing homelessness, to about 1,600, so we've dropped it in half. And he said, that's extraordinary. Why aren't we at the finish line? It's been 10 years, what's holding us up? And I said, the sustained and unambiguous commitment of all orders of government is the only thing standing between us and our goal. He then told me he would call the Premier. I haven't checked in with him since. But why does this matter, though? Those are numbers. And the numbers matter, and the data matters, because this is an evidence-based approach that we're talking about. But having been out on homeless counts more than once, I was always struck by the fact that you would hear at once the same story, and of course, an individual experience in each case of a person you talk to. You would find, of course, residential school survivors and intergenerational residential school survivors and other Indigenous Canadians who have suffered at colonial practices that have injured their dignity. People who have experienced trauma, in other words. You would meet soldiers, this being one of the great base cities in Canada. There are far too many veterans uh, experiencing homelessness in our community, in part because of the trauma that our community talks more openly and more comfortably about, especially close to Remembrance Day. And I met former child soldiers, refugees who had come to our city, come to our country looking for a better life, whose trauma was also a factor in their homelessness. And so the common thread there was trauma, an injury not of their choosing, that was a contributing factor in their homelessness. And each journey to homelessness and each journey out of homelessness is unique and should be honored. And yet, these are the healing efforts of our time. At the very front line of dealing with injustice around the world, 
and in our community. This is what it looks like, and we can turn away, or we can turn towards it, and we can lean into it. And it's also personal for me. My best friend from about grade four to about grade 12 suffers an undiagnosed mental illness. Perhaps it's been diagnosed since. But about the same time I became a city councillor, he became homeless. And I stepped over him one day on my way to work in our city. And it broke my heart when I realized that this person I knew and loved and care about was in that much distress and had been left behind in a place this caring and this compassionate and this wealthy. He, and at that time about 3,200 people, had been left behind. So I became a Housing First advocate. And it's been one of the most important parts of my work, and it's one of the reasons why I stepped up to be chair of Canada's Big City Mayor's Group, was because I believe cities, in partnership with all of you, can get this done. The National Housing Strategy is a huge leap forward, and I salute and commend our federal government for re-entering the housing space with gusto. We've heard that the province wants to partner with us to achieve this goal, and we'll continue those conversations. But very clearly, the community is there. The community is behind us. And I'll just close with this thought, which is not content to end homelessness only to have more people become homeless. We set our sights on a perhaps more audacious project in parallel, which was to begin a conversation in our city about what it would take to end poverty. Because that is the gateway, along with trauma, along with addictions, and along with mental health. These are the social determinants of homelessness. And so in our work, we learned so much. But probably the most transformative thing we learned was from our indigenous working group, who taught us the Cree word for poverty. And I apologize if I mispronounce this. It's Okitimakisu, which is, the Grand Chief is nodding, so must be close. <laughs> which is one who is experiencing deprivation. But it's not about money. It's spiritual impoverishment. It's community impoverishment. It is the impoverishment of health. And that transformed our thinking, because money is part of the picture. But really, that kind of poverty is not up to one individual to solve. That kind of poverty is for a community to wrap their arms around that individual and lift them up with whatever resources are necessary. So homelessness and even poverty are a choice. And I suppose technically someone can choose their own homelessness and can choose a kind of vow of poverty. I imagine that's not spiritually bereft, just materially. But setting aside an individual person's pathway to their experience of homelessness or poverty it is also a choice in our society for all of us to make as citizens and as a community. Do we choose to allow homelessness to persist or do we choose to end it? It is a choice. Do we choose to allow poverty to persist or do we end it? That is a choice. There are more than enough resources to make sure 
None of us step over any of our fellow citizens ever again in our cities and in our towns and in our counties and in our First Nations communities in this country. It is a question of will. And what buoys me is that there are 1,500 people in this room who share that vision and drive that will every single day. And because of you, we'll get it done. So enjoy the conference and enjoy your time in Edmonton. Thank you. So in the last five years, as Mayor Iveson mentioned, we've made more progress on federal leadership on housing and homelessness than in all of the last 30 years combined. A, a return of federal leadership on housing with a $55 billion national housing strategy, a 10-year, $2.2 billion federal homelessness strategy, and a legislated right to housing. These are all products of the hard work of our next speaker, Mr. Adam Vaughan, the Member of Parliament for Spadina, Fort York, and currently the only Liberal MP in Alberta. Uh, he, Adam is, uh, <laughs> that's going to get me in all kinds of trouble. Um, Adam is arguably one of the most effective advocates for housing and homelessness we've had in Parliament for a very long time. Please welcome Adam Vaughan. Thank you very much, and, and uh, uh, thank you to uh, the chiefs, the, the elders, and, and the ceremonial party that, uh, that drummed us in, and the singers. Uh, it is always good to be um, in a space that has been blessed so beautifully, and, and uh, uh, it also focuses our attention where it needs to be, which is on making sure that, that uh, while many have home, few have shelter in, in too many communities across this country. The challenge uh, that we are addressing is, is work that's yet to be done. Uh, we, have, we have done some good things over the last few years, uh, but we have a new parliament and we have new challenges in front of us. And uh, we have just come through a campaign where housing was talked about, but homelessness wasn't. Uh, and while there are uh, new parliamentarians making their way to Ottawa, uh, they need to hear the voices from these conferences and the rooms that you'll be uh, speaking in in the next few days uh, you need to drive our coalition and our consensus through Parliament in the next months ahead. It is critical that this Parliament is the Parliament that solves homelessness across this country, that takes a stake and, and, and makes a point of, of not just managing the crisis, but solving the problem once and for all. But we're not going to do that if we simply barter between political parties. We're going to do that if we listen to the public, if we listen to your movement, our movement, if we listen to the voice of the homeless, the people with lived experience who are demanding it of us, we have got to get it done in this parliament. It is a unique opportunity to have parliamentarians from across Canada uh, being given the opportunity to select their work plan over the next two, three, who knows how many years, but to select that work plan. And if you get your voices heard, and I will make sure that we amplify them and, and, and accelerate those works as much as possible, if you drive that consensus to Parliament, Parliament will have no choice but to act. And so I'm calling on all of you, all of us, over the next few days to make sure that the message that comes from this room is end homelessness, end it now, make the investments that are needed, and please, 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 let's start with the work that starts over the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. So, um, over the course of my life, I have been really lucky to meet lots of uh, powerful people, including lots of politicians, ministers, and premiers, and prime ministers. I've met powerful leaders in business uh, and society, but I don't think I've ever met a person that I felt I was in the presence of greatness until I met our keynote, Dr. Uh, Grand Chief Willie Littlechild. Grand Chief Littlechild uh, is a gifted athlete, a politician, and a lawyer. He's been inducted into seven sports halls of fame. Uh, he was the first Indigenous person appointed to the Queen's Council by Alberta Law Society, and he was the first Treaty Indian Member of Parliament. Grand Chief Littlechild was a commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, 
whose final report was released on December 15, 2015. You'll find the principles of reconciliation from that report in the back of your program. He's also got a list of honors and awards that is as long as my arm. Grand Chief Littlechild is one of the most humble, kind, and thoughtful people you will run into, but you'll also know the moment you meet him that he's a man of depth, with steel in his spine, a brilliant intellect, great humor, and a tireless champion for and among our Indigenous relatives. Friends, it's my pleasure to introduce Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild. Nigan Gakio, Katam Scott now. Me or Sena Semi in a pego, a mamopia can get on Staki Voyotse. Can San Magetsna Tagi Totamak. Can San Magetsna Tagi Toyak. Out of Peggy Witzig, to them nog. A guy got the maize, papa me, Otenak. Kick sepoma, we had some mustata go up seas. Tanegan martit, Tanegan martit caps. Otenak Mochik and Patsik Exanaskomak Semanto at Sipigo Akamemoyak Ketego Tahapsik, Kinelaskom no Nsim Kagis Mostamago Aganots Askomao Mstugaski go Tahanots. Tato gan gamotsik na naskumag. Kakyo gista wao na naskum na wao. Mistaki wao magatota mek. E wichi hae kik kakte magsik. Ati to asak. Ati kehteyak. Magatsip go. Ah, chip go. A witchy high egg. Exkin and ask him now. I bring you greetings in my language to acknowledge all of you, your excellencies, so that I don't exclude anyone because of the important work that you do. But I wanted to highlight our elders and thank them for their ongoing guidance and leadership. My brother, Chief Mustas, who not only led and opened this morning's meeting, but lifted the pipe at the sunrise ceremony, the two pipes, the men's pipe and the women's pipe, for that ceremony. And I mention that because the story I'm going to tell you is connected to that very ceremony. It's not very long ago. I know some of you were not born yet, 1996. But that's the time the last residential school closed. And I would like to share with you this morning the link that we need to make 
with the residence school legacy and history, with the homelessness that we see today. You see, it was not too long ago that we could not have an invocation by a chief. It was not too long ago we could not have this. It was not allowed. It's not too long ago that we could hear a drum and the keepers of our sacred songs sing a flag song, honor song, victory song. So while I talk about the residential school history and its impact and its connection to homelessness, I think I need to also honor the victory of many like you in the audience here today. I have some pictures I want to show you and as soon as they're able to put them on a screen, I will use that presentation. I want to begin by asking you just to close your eyes for a moment. Close your eyes for a moment. And go back, if you can, to the day that you were seven years old. Think back to that day. What was home like then? What was your childhood like then? You as a seven-year-old. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door and you're taken. You're taken from your parents and you're put into a residential school or a boarding school, as some are called. How would you feel? How did you feel, some of you, the survivors in the room, at that moment when you were taken from your parents? How did the parents feel when they lost their child? and could not do anything about it. Because as you see, this was a legislated form of assimilation, the residential school system. Not only should you be thinking about how you would feel or how you felt, many parents through tears and anger sometimes said to us, when we were doing the Truth Commission, I couldn't stand the pain of losing my child. And that's why I went to alcohol. That's why I went to drugs. That's why I went to the cities. In other words, that's why I'm homeless. So this story, and the mayor mentioned it, his worship, Mayor Iverson, and I thank him for all his leadership because he mentioned someone that we should be thinking about. And I want to think about myself as we enter this coming week where we remember veterans, I traveled many places and one of the saddest connection I have to the homeless is when I see veterans 
homeless. So I want to dedicate my words to my late dad, who was a World War II veteran, and my uncle, two uncles, but one in particular, an uncle, Second World War, who was shot three times, once on the arm and twice on the legs, on one leg. And when he got hit, the story goes from his comrades, as they called them, because he wouldn't tell us. When he hit the ground the first time, sergeant said, come on, chief, get up. We've got to keep going. So he got up, and he started running, running, only to be shot twice again. Sergeant said to them, come on, chief, get up, get up. Well, he couldn't get up. So they thought he had been killed. He doesn't know how long he was out in the field until he woke up as a prisoner of war in the hospital. The reason I tell you that story because he died homeless. And yet, when I show you this picture that was just shown, if you can go back to, I don't know where the technicians are. We're beginning on a journey to end homelessness. This is a school a residential school. When you were seven, as I asked you, and you're taken away and put into a building like this, like me, actually, they broke the law, actually, because the law said you were to be taken when you were seven. Well, I was taken when I was six, and I remember the day in the winter time, the team of horses being dropped off at this school. For 11 years, I lived in this building. And when we talk about being disconnected, when we talk about homeless people, The first disconnection that happens when you enter that kind of a building, some even call it a jail, a prison, because it looks like it. This one, you'll see at the top floor, is where all the sisters lived. Sometimes I get in trouble for this one because the next floor below that is where all the girls used to live. And people will say, well, how do you know that? Well, the reason I know that is seven of my sisters lived on that floor. I know my sisters by name, but even though we were in the same building, I don't know them as a sister. The floor below that is the classroom section. And the floor below that, the basement, was the dining hall. You'll see the building right next to it, to the right, was the boys' dorm. There's big boys, medium boys, and little boys. But I remember the day my name was taken. My name is Mahikan Mohteu walking wolf. My Christian name is Wilton, little child. My residence, residential school name was number 65. 65, come here, you idiot. Or 65, why did you do that? 65, pick up that pencil, stupid. 
So when you do that to a child, what is it that is disconnected? When you cut their braids on the first day of school, what is the loss there? So imagine now you're eight, nine, ten years old. There's a horse barn back there. There's a hog barn. There's a chicken coop. There's a cow barn. There's a garden. So actually, as children, we were taking care of ourselves. If you were to do that today, you would probably be charged fairly quickly with child labor. So I want to do quickly a refresher on your journey we had together on a residential school legacy. As you know, the commission was a court ordered commission. It was unique in the world because it's the first commission that was ordered by courts. It's the first commission that looks at children and looks at what happens to the family. When we had our first break after the first round of read hearings, we immediately concluded that the residential school policy was a direct assault on our languages, on our culture, on our family, and our community. So what happens to children when you do that to them? We were very pleased that the Governor General at the day of the day, Mikhail Jean, agreed to be our first honorary witness. By the way, His Worship Mayor Iveson is also an honorary witness. We asked survivors, how should we go about this work? Because some of them told us, I've been trying to hide this story for 50 years or 60 years. My children don't know what happened to me. My family doesn't know what happened to me. So the elders in their wisdom said, don't listen to anyone unless it's a safe setting. Make sure that there's cultural support, spiritual support, medical and mental support around that individual before you ask them what happened to you as a child in residential school. So we had survivors from across the country. So very quickly, we were ordered by the courts to stay, get, gather the truth. What happened in these residential schools? They also ordered us to, to have seven national events. We had a national event in this very building, actually. And again, with the wisdom of our elders, they told us, why did you take one of the sacred teachings as a theme for each of those gatherings. So the first gathering we had, the theme was about respect, a very fundamental indigenous teaching. And it's not only indigenous, it's a universal teaching, respect. Then we went north, some of you from the north. We applaud your courage because to live and survive in the north where some of the most isolated residential schools were, takes a lot of courage. The next one I thought was going to be very difficult because we heard many times the impact of being torn away from your parents, growing up without any emotion of love. I thought, this is not going to work. But happily, 
to say to you I was so wrong because one young person got up and said, you know, I used to hate myself. I used to hate that I'm brown. But now I'm on a healing journey, and every morning now when I get up, I can say to myself, I love you. I love you. We heard former students say, you know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even tell my spouse, my partner, husband or wife, I love you. I couldn't tell my children or my grandchildren because I don't know what love is. So sometimes we end up disconnected from each other within the family. So then we asked honorary witnesses, prominent Canadians like His Worship, Mayor Iveson and others, if they would be willing to be an honorary witness. Because in our tradition, when you're an honorary witness, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to share how you're feeling about what you just heard about this story of residential schools. So we made a report early on and we published a document called They Came for the Children. And the stories that you hear about how they came and rounded us up. September came to be known as the crying month because that's what parents and grandparents remember. When their children were taken, the last thing they remember is the voice of their child crying as they were taken. So we did a report after 7,000 stories the court didn't tell us that we should look at the missing children, but we did it anyway because we started hearing about the children that died in residential schools, the children that never came home. And gladly, about three weeks ago, we had a celebration in Ottawa to honor those now close to 6,000 names of children who died at these schools, who went missing. I remember an old man from St. Albert here say, there was two schools in Edmonton, one by St. Albert, and he said, I used to see children burying children. Children burying children. Because he said, I, see, I lived so close to the school. Children who were put on a plane in the far north thinking they've never been on a plane before that this was going to be exciting. So they were flown from their community to Ottawa where they were put on a train for three days and three nights to Edmonton. When they got here, they were put on another plane and flown to Aklavik and Northwest Territories and Yukon, 2,500 miles away from home. My school was only three miles away. But how can you think about running away from that school, trying to go home when it's 2,500 miles away? So of course, some died along the way. There's a picture in my mind, it's etched in my mind to this very day of four little boys hugging each other, frozen to death, because they had ran away from school hoping to go home. Home. So you see, we then focused on education, culture and language, and what happened to them at the residential school. 
spirituality and how it was assaulted. I sometimes talk about, I need to respect your time, so I want to hurry up here. I had a problem like that once, and I said, you know, my people, we only have, well, actually, we have a lot of problems, but there's two particular health problems we have, and it's diabetes. I said, what? Diabetes, I think I just created a new word, I said. Diabetes and obesity. So we have principles of reconciliation because after six and a half years and listening to these stories, we asked ourselves, what were the 10 main teachings? What are the principles that we gather out of this for reconciliation? I know in your agenda, for example, you're going to be talking about the Convention on the Rights of the Child, a rights-based approach. The UN Declaration specifically references in Article 23, housing. So it's also a rights-based approach. The second principle is that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis have treaty constitutional and treaty rights that must be recognized and respected. Do you know that there is actually a treaty right to shelter? Old people tell us there were four trees at treaty time they protected because those trees were important for us, either have teepee poles or tent poles or to build our own homes with them. So there's a treaty right to shelter. You're going to be talking from the, with the youth about the Convention on Rights of the Child. A third principle of reconciliation that is a process of healing relationships, and you know this, but also it's about redressing past harms. Because what's happening today on the streets and the cities and towns is the intergenerational trauma. Young people asked us, my parents went to residential school, but we didn't. And yet, we're facing this trauma. It's inherited through family. A young woman asked us in the Yukon, thank her brave, bravery. She said, I like this, that you're dealing with children, the rights of children, what happens to them. I like it that you're dealing with the parents, she said, but what about me? I came after, and I have the same problems. So the intergenerational trauma and homelessness are directly connected. Reconciliation requires action to address the destructive impacts. And one of those impacts that's not listed is housing, as it was mentioned by Mayor Iverson, and the need to for, for us to focus on urban housing. Because there's a transmigration among our people from the reserve to the city and back to the reserve and they crisscross sometimes. And we get lost in the middle. Reconciliation must create more equitable society, closing the gaps, one of which, of course, is about housing. You're talking here about housing first, so that's an important connection. You see the photograph of assimilation, the before and after residential school of those children. One thing I'm very happy and encouraged about is in Canada now, people are beginning to admit that they too are treaty peoples. All Canadians are treaty peoples. But the important thing about that is that we have a joint and shared responsibility. It's not only about benefits, but it's a responsibility for mutually respectful relationships. Perspectives of our elders need to be considered. I know you're going to be talking, for example, on the challenges that face vulnerable adults. 
You're going to be talking about housing as a social determinant of health to older people. But a very significant, significant impact that I know that you're dealing with on a daily basis, which is only now beginning to capture some support, is mental health. The mental health. I meet with some of the elders and some of the homeless. One time I was at a meeting with the homeless people here in Edmonton, and one of the guys says, you know, I'm not prejudiced. I like black people. I like white people. I like yellow people, the Orientals. I even like red people. But sometimes I wonder about myself, he said, just caught off the street. I woke up this morning, I'm black and blue. <laughs> Got a big licking last night, he said. Even though he was homeless, he still found that medicine of healing through humor. I admire him. So mental health. The importance of our connection to land. You can see that you're beginning to probably catch, I hope, that while the Canadian definition of homelessness has four elements, the indigenous perspective of homelessness has 12 elements. 12 elements. One of those elements is the spiritual connection to the land. The old man told us, you know, when they took us away from our parents' residential school, don't forget, they also took us away from the land. And that's an impact from residential school. So reconciliation will require political will, and thank you, Member of Parliament, for being here, and the minister who had to leave, and also other leaders in the room for being here, because not only will it take political will, but joint leadership. And I'm glad to see this happening. There's beginning to be joint working relationships, and that really is about reconciliation. Where does one start? on this journey of reconciliation to make that link of residential school to homelessness. Well, I suggest you read that 94 calls to action. Take one of those calls that speaks to you and make a commitment that you'll work on that one. Otherwise, there are 10 principles, and I would suggest looking at the 10th principle as a starting point. Reconciliation requires sustained public education, dialogue, and youth engagement. I see in your agenda there's a lot of discussion about youth and homelessness, and I really applaud you for doing that, looking at that. But it's also important to learn about the history and legacy of residential schools about treaties and the Aboriginal rights and past and present contributions of Indigenous peoples to Canadian society, like the veterans we just talked about. Do you know in Canada and the United States, the largest number of volunteers for World War I and World War II on a, from a racial perspective were indigenous peoples. The largest number of volunteers who served in the wars are indigenous peoples. Next week, we will be honoring them in my community where we have 42 just from my community. So you could start with finding out about some of the contributions we made. And just as I created a new word about diabetes, I was talking also really fast about reconciliation, and I was talking to teachers, and I said, you know, what we got to do about this is reconciliation. <laughs> created another word. <laughs> yeah. But you know, recently, 
the 10 principles of reconciliation that we adopted here in Canada through the commitment by the government to support and endorse the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. Those 10 principles have now been adopted at the Human Rights Council in Geneva about two months ago, but they've been in, in, internationalized. Ours were focusing on Canada, but now they've taken them because they want to use them around the world. So thank you and I applaud your work. We have a definition, I think it might be in your handouts, about the definition of homelessness for indigenous peoples. And as I mentioned, there are 12 elements or 12 aspects of homelessness in the definition. But as we started beginning to end homelessness, I'm gonna create another new word. Take away the word less from that term. So it's gonna be about homeness, not about homelessness. New word. I hope I can open this. I don't know if I can. Can a techie help me with this? I wanna close with this uh, video. I wanna close it for a purpose. Somebody, can you open this? Techie, techie. This is not really related to homelessness, but I hope you can see it because it's the end I want you to focus on. Can we have it? No? We can't. Okay, it's really too bad. Really, 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 really too bad. Are you sure? Come on. <laughs> I'm supposed to be able to open this. Okay, well then I'll close now. See this school? It's the same school that I showed you from um, what sometimes people call the bird's eye view. It was taken from the air. And then it's the word's eye view, worm's eye view. There's a fence in front of that school. Sometimes people say, so what? There's a barbed wire fence. And they say, ah, oh, come on, Willie, get over it. But that was a electric fence in front of that school. That's what kept me and my colleagues in that building. For 11 years where I was number 65, then I got sent here in Edmonton for three more years in a different school, but they still deny that it's a residential school. But I guarantee you, I lived there for three years. So I don't know if we have time. I don't think we have time for questions. So if they work on that video, you gotta see it at some point. It is awesome, awesome. So thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I took a lot of your time, but. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you. So as I take my crutches, there's a country, or there's only two kinds of songs, they say, country and western. <laughs> there's one song about don't let your boys grow up to be cowboys. They're gonna end up like this, or hockey players. So thank you and have a great, great conversation here for the next two days. I'm going to leave you with two words. I'm sorry, I'm going to leave you with two words because I'm so proud of a city where we had a meeting last two days ago, actually, in Wetaskiwin. 
with the mayor, the RCMP, the social workers, the RC, uh, city police, the volunteers, and the four chiefs sitting down together developing a plan on how we are going to end homelessness in Wetuski Win. It's actually Wetuski Win. But Edmonton, Edmonton, actually the Cree word for Edmonton is Waskaikanik. Waskaikanik. Do you know what that means? It's the house. It used to refer to Fort Edmonton, but it's actually the house. What a um, blessed opportunity we have to be discussing homelessness in a Cree city called Waskaikanik and be talking about coming home. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, uh, we're grateful and honored uh, to be gathered on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Dene, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. I want to thank Treaty 6 for their warm welcome they've offered us. And over the course of this uh, conference, we're going to pay tribute uh, to our Indigenous relatives through ceremony uh, and learning. But you know, having heard a Grand Chief Little Child, um, it's not enough for us to acknowledge the land and first stewards of the land in this conference takes place on. We have to take the opportunity to listen to the insights available to us here and we have to act, reconciliation. As, as Grand Chief Little Child said, we're all treaty people and we have a shared responsibility. We all work in the machinery of colonization in the homeless system. And we have to act where we can to advance decolonization and reconciliation. And, and before anybody thinks or says, well, you know, that's too big or too hard or that's somebody else's job, I'll remind you that we're already in the business of doing the impossible. So we brought this conference here to Edmonton this year to recognize, learn from, and be inspired by the city's remarkable accomplishments on the road to ending homelessness. Under the leadership of Homeward Trust, Edmonton has reduced homelessness more than any other big city in the country. Since 2009, they've reduced overall homelessness by 43%, and since just January, have reduced chronic homelessness an additional 15%. There's still more to do, but Edmonton is proving what everyone here believes to be true, that homelessness can and will end. Edmonton has been joined this year by a growing list of communities like Chatham-Kent, Madison Hat, Guelph, and Kawartha Halliburton, who are all driving measurable reductions in chronic homelessness month over month. They will soon be joined by others, and I know when we gather next year, we will celebrate communities having reduced chronic and or veteran homelessness by at least 50%, and we will recognize the first community or communities who have achieved functional zero chronic homelessness. We're meeting now at a time of great hope, great promise and achievement at a scale that few of us would have dared possible, would have dared to dream possible even five years ago. We have a legislated right to housing, a national housing strategy, a new, ho new housing being built across the country and communities rapidly transforming their responses. Friends, we are seeing the beginning of the end of homelessness in Canada. You know, each of you here today are part of an alliance of individuals and organizations from every corner of the country, united and bound together by our shared mission to end homelessness. You are part of something huge. There are over 1,500 people in this room. What you see here today is only a small part of our larger alliance. Your co-workers, your partners, your donors, your volunteers, your supporters, your allies at home are all part of this movement. 
Our alliance is rich and strong in its diversity. In this room are elders, knowledge keepers, traditional people. There are frontline workers of every description, community leaders and donors. There are advocates, policy makers and politicians. There are doctors and police officers. There are people here from every province and territory in Canada. There are world leading experts, researchers and academics. And speaking of experts, there are over 150 people with lived experience of homelessness or perhaps more accurately lived expertise. Alliances can change the world because they combine the skill, effort, wisdom, and passion and strength of their members. And those members reinforce and support one another. The work of ending homelessness can be challenging, hard, and often isolating. This conference is an opportunity for you to recharge your batteries, support, be supported by your peers, learn from world-leading experts, and be inspired by those we serve. And of course, have some fun. Uh, no trip to Edmonton is complete without some fun. Um, while you're here, though, seek out new ideas, innovations, and skills that will accelerate your efforts back home. I'm going to pause now just for a minute uh, for all of us to remember why we're here and to set our intention for our time together. Every year, we put a candle on stage, or a couple of candles on stage, and that's here to remind us of those who we've lost to homelessness, to remind us of the urgency of our work. We're going to pause now for a moment of silence. I want you to think about someone you know who's been lost to homelessness. Think about the people you know who are still homeless. I want you to visualize ending homelessness and what you're going to do over the next two and a half days to make that vision a reality. <laughs> 